Our next speaker, uh, Robert Shibatani, is a physical hydrologist and long-standing advisor to the California water industry and expert in contemporary climate-adjusted hydrology. He's CEO of the Shibatani Group, a global-focused water resources specialty firm in climate change hydrology, hydrology, new storage projects, dramatically variable flow management, water governance, governance transboundary water allocation, and climate change water security. So uh, welcome, Robert, uh, one of the uh, movers and shakers behind this event. Well, thank you very much for the introduction, Ken. Um, I think, as most of us here probably realize, the uh, subject of new water storage development um, here in California really isn't a new topic. If you harken back to the uh, heyday periods, and I think there was some discussion about this earlier, about uh, a reservoir development era back in the uh, mid part of the last century, where many of our state and federal projects were developed, uh, along with many of our regional water facilities. You know, during that interceding time, the whole idea or concept of new storage development in California really hasn't gone away. So for most of us, water resource managers here, the concept of building new storage on stream or off stream really hasn't disappeared over the last 50 or, or even 60 years. Uh, but there has been over the interceding decades, various projects that have come to the fore. And unfortunately, or maybe not fortunately, uh, they haven't received the same level of immediacy, urgency, and certainly interest with perhaps what certain projects uh, we're dealing with today. And if you think about it, over the past several decades, there's been a number of emerging issues, factors, and challenges that are now facing us in the contemporary new storage, uh, new storage development vernacular that perhaps we haven't embraced or experienced in the past. So what I want to deal with here today is talk a little bit about some of the uh, driving factors that's really promoting a new dialogue of new storage development here in California. When you think about some of the factors and the intersecting issues that we've uh, uh, embraced and experienced over the last several decades, uh, many of them are uh, being driven by things such as increased population. Uh, we talked about the increased complexity related to our environmental regulatory environment, uh, the uncertainties associated with not only what our future regulatory environment looks like, but also some of the uncertainties associated with um, the physical environment, things such as climate change. So all these intersecting issues make for a very distinct and unique platform of discussion regarding water storage or new water storage in California that we perhaps haven't experienced in the past. And I hearken back to a recent aqua conference that many of you may recall where we talked about new storage development within the context of what California is dealing with. And it was part of the statewide issues forum at the time, talking about new storage development, and we had the rather fortuitous title um, uh, labeled, Not Your Grandfather's Storage Project. And it has some, um, it has some lingering resonance in what we're talking about today, because the overall format of the issues that are facing us in the contemporary context of new storage development here in 2013 again, as my colleagues have, have um, eloquently uh, espoused earlier, is very different than what we are talking about today relative uh, to the past. So I want to spend a little bit of time with you today talking about some of the driving factors that are moving the water industry dialogue towards new storage development in the contemporary context. Talk about some of the intersecting factors that we are dealing with today that perhaps weren't available decade, two decades ago, and then expand that discussion to put the new storage contexts or, or, or possibilities within the contemporary framework of the issues that we are facing today relative to perhaps 40, 50, or 60 years ago. So with that, my title, not, uh, for the title of the presentation, not surprisingly, is New Area of, era of Water Storage Development. I could probably have put in a preface in front of that um, label we are in a new era of water storage development, uh, enhancing ongoing state water initiatives. Perhaps a convenient place to start 
is to talk a little bit about what is driving the need for new storage development here in California. I think as most of us recognize, we have an available supply, I term it system yield, that varies from year to year, but is for the most part limited. We have a fixed infrastructure. We have, for all intents and purposes, a fixed regulatory framework that doesn't allow us as practitioners a lot of flexibility to move things around. So our system yield on any given year is fairly capped. It's limited. And we know that the average precipitation in California is about 200 million acre feet a year. Um, our managed supply, the supply that we actually have discretionary authority to meet out in, in various uh, forms, is about 40%. So we have, we can put our fingers on and our hands on about 80 million acre feet. But the actual supply um, system yield is fairly capped because again, as I mentioned, fixed infrastructure, fixed regulatory framework. So what are some of these deriving factors? Well, the fact that we have our system yield that is being constantly depleted through a number of various um, uh, depletion elements, such as supply limitations, and we talked about the increased uh, rigidity with environmental flow regulations or requirements uh, today relative to maybe 20 or 30 years ago, the increased uh, challenges between offsetting supply enhancement relative to flood control evacuation, the ongoing annual challenge that reservoir operators have to deal with on a case-to-case -case basis and annually, the ongoing downstream water quality concerns, and of course the associated ESA thermal controls that weren't perhaps available or at least present 5, 10, 15 years ago. All of this is driving the recognition amongst the water users that we have to develop new system yield here in California. And it has to be dealt with in a context of an infrastructural framework that is both adaptable and flexible to meet not only uncertainties with a regulatory environment, but also the uncertainties associated with the physical environment with such things as climate change. And most water agencies that I'm dealing with here have recognized that over the last 5, 10, 15 years. And many of the water agencies that are located in the area of climate change action, what do I mean by that? Talk about the areas where we're first going to feel the effects of hydroclimatic shiftings. That's up in the Sierras. That's up in the snowpack. That's where the action is going to first start to really manifest itself. And in my opinion, it's already happened today. And I think you've heard some of that in the past. So we have projects that may for whatever reason have been on the back burner for several decades, and now resuscitate themselves. We have a new dialogue, we have new interest. Um, I think some of you may have heard or, or saw the press release by NID a couple of weeks ago saying that, hey, Parker Reservoir, Rollins, uh, Rollins Dam raised back on the table. One of my clients, El Dorado County Water Agency, we're resuscitating, maybe not resuscitating is a bad word, but um, reinvigorating reconstituting a project, you probably remember this, the SOFAR project on the, so on, on the South Fork of the American, back into play. And how are we doing that? Now, this is very interesting. We're talking about an on-stream, on-stream reservoir project with conceptual design capacities of 200,000 acre feet. Now, this project has been accepted as part of Reclamation's non-federal cost-sharing partners. It exists in Reclamation's existing Sacramento San Joaquin to uh, Tulare Basin study. Think about the threshold politically that we have passed with the inclusion of this project within that basin study. Reclamation is essentially saying once this basin study is done, you are now eligible for fe uh, federal feasibility dollars that we will allow you to then study this. We then have a 200,000 on stream new reservoir in the South Fork of the American River upstream of Reclamation's primary federal facility in the American River Basin. Now that's a kind of a landmark decision, or not, or not a landmark decision, but it's a landmark sort of milestone threshold that we've passed. And it's an indication, in my view, that not only the federal agency, but many local agencies are realizing that new storage and yield development in California really has to be a multi-agency collaborative process. So we have Reclamation now saying to us, we will support that project for you once our basin study is done. So, what is the underlying physical basis or rationale for new water storage in California? Well, there are a number of factors. One important factor, of course, is the shifting hydroclimatic signal, the progression of earlier and altered seasonal runoff response. 
and uh, my previous um, colleagues have uh, espoused eloquently on what that means. Essentially what we're talking about with the migration from a snow-dominated watershed response to a rain-dominated water response is we're moving from here to here. And what does that mean in terms of operational volumetric changes for res operators? Essentially what you're talking about is an increased volume in the late fall, early winter months, which will be offset by a corresponding decrease in the late spring, early summer months. What it then represents, ladies and gentlemen, is the characteristic signal for watersheds that are snow dominated. And for California on the terrestrial side, so the Sierras and the Southern Cascades, this shift in hydrology essentially represents a climate change response signal for California. Now, what are some of the timing shifts and yield implications? Um, here are two panels from the Sierras. The left-hand side is the Upper American, uh, Upper American River Basin that you're all familiar with, Big Creek Basin in the Southern Sierras. The black line represents the average monthly runoff historically for the last 34 years. Those colored red lines represent projected runoff in the future under that assumed uh, climatic forcing signal. So let's pick the month of May. It happens to be the peak flow month. Well, there's where we are today. Now, under a future forecast, there's where we're going to be tomorrow. And I don't mean tomorrow by as immediately tomorrow at 12.01 a.m., but it's a gradual progression moving into, a, uh, moving into the future. Even eyeballing that differential in monthly flow runoff, we're talking about something that's at least 30% or one third, maybe as much as 40%. So you ask yourself as a watershed planner, you ask yourself as a res operator, can you manage a 40% uh, 40 drop in average monthly flows during your peak month given existing operational practices? I'll leave that sort of unanswered for now. Um, what we're essentially saying, and I think some of my colleagues talked about this before, we have a loss of a natural snowpack. The snowpack is always serve as a natural reservoir. Now with increasing water temperature, or uh, increasing air temperatures, you're gonna have that progression from precipitation to rain. What you have then is for these watersheds, your T sub C or your, your time to lag is diminishing. You have a more direct rainfall runoff response. We can't sit there and say, hey, the snowpack's up in the Sierras, it's not gonna melt for another four months, we're safe. It's going to be a little more immediate. So the hydrograph responses that we're going to see up in the Sierras and the Southern Cascades are going to more closely mimic the hydrograph pattern. And what that means when you look at overall unit hydrographs all across the Sierras is you're going to see a flattening of that because the spring freshet is gone. And because it's more direct runoff, it's going to shift earlier in the season. Now, what are the implications then for water managers and water planners when they're dealing with that kind of reality in hydrodynamic shifts? Here we have a situation, and what I like to do to get a really good sense of this is I look for the inflection points. So look at the historical hydrology. Again, in this case, it's the black line. Look at the future hydrology, predicted or projected. That's the red line. And let's start looking at these inflection points. Well, there's the first one, somewhere around March. There's the other one, somewhere around November. What happens then is that depending on whether you exclusively rely on all your operations on historical hydrology, then you are embracing the black line. If you accept the fact that there could be changes in future hydrologic response, then you'll probably want to adopt or embrace something more along the red lines. So in other words, what we do when we identify these inflection points, so we look for the period where, where the black line crosses the red. So depending on whether you rely on historical hydrology relative to future hydrology, you could be underestimating your fall winter volumes or correspondingly overestimating your late spring, early summer volumes. And that has some pretty significant implications to regional water agreements, some of your existing permits, some of your operational considerations when you're dealing with reservoirs. Reservoir spills. It's a high degree of variability as my colleagues before me um, uh, explained, a lot of it depends on individual watershed characteristics. Here I'm going to focus on the Upper American River Basin. Spills in those um, reservoirs, upstream of existing terminal reservoirs, could do as much as this. And at least on the, oops, 
at least on the upper Merkur basin, we could get those upper reservoir spills as early, at least in this study, five months. Five months earlier in those upstream reservoirs. Think of what that means to overall CDP, SWP operations when those reservoir operators in Folsom, New Melones, Oroville, Shasta, Trinity, whatever, are now faced with the idea that an additional volume and certainly a shifted temporal pattern are going to be represented by inflows into those reservoirs. It can affect everything from cold water pool management, flood evacuation and then encroachment curves, the, pro, uh, the projections that they can then provide to environmental groups as far as their ability to meet downstream habitat and flow considerations. So what this means again, just as a quick uh, summary on this uh, slide, is that the implications to the downstream rim reservoirs, okay, so rim reservoirs that provide that last mile of storage, storage capabilities before we hit the Central Valley, they could increasingly come under significant pressures to revise operational prescriptions. Now these shifts, regardless of where you look, and we've been dealing with this for at least 10 years, maybe as much as almost two decades, these shifts in those watersheds that are reliant historically on a snow-dominated uh, pattern, they are consistent. As Mike mentioned, there's a heck of a lot of variability between individual watershed diagnostic characteristics and depending on the climatic forcing models that you pick, because we have many available to us. But the same overall trend, regardless of whether we're talking about watersheds in other areas of the United States, in the European Union, areas in Central Asia, or even in California, that shift is consistent in the published literature. Now for California then, the inflow to our uh, terminal reservoirs, and again, regardless of whether we're talking about Shasta, Oroville, Folsom, um, or Trinity, that early period, that seasonal period at the very front, so I'm going to go back one, that early period, that, that differential between the historic response and what we're projecting in the future, that's where the action is going to be occurring, and that's very, very important. Now, these shifts, for the most part, um, are recognized by most water agencies in the United States. And this information has been known for a long time, so there's no secret. Now, the real challenge, ladies and gentlemen, comes in not the fact that these agencies have that information, but we're all water purveyors, water users. When we deal with a federal agency, it's usually on a regulatory matter. So that information has to be conveyed down to the operational people that you're dealing with. So as an example, NOAA, they have some tremendous divisions, workshops, scientific departments that deal with climate change science. They deal with the oceanic factors, the atmospheric factors, the terrestrial hydrology factors. I'm sitting there negotiating a Section 7 consultation with NOAA, as an example. I've brought all my environmental documentation that is replete with NOAA-based current science. At this point in time, I do not have a guarantee or assurance that the person that I'm negotiating the actual terms and conditions have the ability to understand and have access to the information that the broader agency has developed. And that is a disconnect. Because these major water agencies, they have tremendous ability to generate this information. But does that information get down to the ground level where we, we as practitioners, are negotiating terms and conditions? And it doesn't matter what we're dealing with, you know, whether it's terms and conditions associated with an RPA, the water right, the FERC license, what have you. That information has to sort of be available. If that does not happen, then the overall uh, prospects of achieving climate change adaptation in water resources in California is essentially moot because we'll have lost that. Now, what are our options then? If we accept the fact that we need new system yield and that has to be dealt with in some kind of operational infrastructure framework that is both adaptable and flexible, then there really is only one option. And that is, in my view, creating new water storage. And because I'm a snowmelt hydrologist, I always like to focus on the areas where the action is occurring. So let's focus on the upper high elevation areas where we know, for example, precipitation occurs there, runoff is there. We don't have to convey, transfer, uh, endure, accept additional energy costs to move water from point A to point B. Climate change, the, the transition from snow to rain, it's happening up there. Why not put the impoundments where the action is actually happening? So I am a, I've, I've always been sort of a, um, 
a strong proponent of high elevation storage options. I gave this um, sort of similar presentation to the California Water Commission who didn't know what high elevation storage option was. Uh, and they always wanted to see pictures, so there we go. Gordon Creek Reservoir and East Bowman, Ice House Reservoir by um, SMUD is part of the UR project, and of course, um, PCWA's uh, Middle Park Project, Halpo. Now, what makes those reservoirs different? Fairly simple. They're located at the precipitation source. They're located in the areas where runoff is generated. I don't have to move water from point A to point B. I can circumvent all the energy costs because that's where the action is occurring. All the excess flows in California happen in those areas. What makes it different from a physical perspective? Well, again, because of their geographic location, they are confined to first, second, third order watersheds. They are relatively isolated, so we don't have to embark upon uh, the same level of threat for eminent domain. They are steeper draining valleys with thinner surficial overburden. So what does that really mean hydrologically? You sort of get rid of all that uh, hydrologic vernacular. What it means is that the precipitation and the snow melt flux Less of it's going to be lost to phreatic stores. Our reservoirs, if you build them in those high elevation storage areas, will refill quicker and more effectively. Now, again, um, I like focusing again on you know this is the first area of the, you know, the Sierras, the first area where we as water managers will start to experience, and I quite might add, are experiencing the effects of climatic forcings today. Operationally, what makes it different? Well, now, now we're getting kind of some interesting issues because these reservoirs, given the fact that they are upstream of existing federal state reservoirs, they are largely unaffected by downstream delta operations directly. You already have a system of rim reservoirs that, that function as the last line of defense before the Central Valley. I put a reservoir like Alder, 200,000 uh, acre foot reservoir up in uh, Kyberg's on the South Fork. I do not have a direct, I, again, I want to emphasize that as, as Pete uh, uh, eloquently uh, described, I do not have a direct obligation to meet Delta operations such as water quality needs, at least before Reclamation does at Folsom. Folsom's the first call for all Delta unbalance. We all know that. It's got the shortest travel time. We call on Folsom first as opposed to Shasta so we can get water from Folsom down to, down to the Delta in two and a half days, where Shasta takes four to five days. With a reservoir upstream from an existing impoundment, we don't have the same considerations with fish passage. Fish passage there's already an impoundment. We can benefit from providing additional flood encroachment, again, to that downstream reservoir and um, related issues to thermal controls. Folsom has some tremendous obligations to meet downstream with thermal requirements in Lower American River. I put a reservoir up by, up by Kyber's up in the, up in the almost in desolation wilderness. I guarantee you NIMS is not going to come to my table and ask me for some more stream temperature targets. It's just not a part of the mix. So what I'm suggesting is, given the fact that California has already invested a lot of time and money developing these terminal reservoirs, why are we even thinking about going downstream? Put the reservoirs upstream in a daisy chain fashion, and we can avoid a lot of those primary obligations that the resource agencies are coming us or coming after. Now, what does high elevation storage on stream storage do? Well, essentially increases system yield by capturing more excess flow. It provides that additional retention capability upstream that has duality of purpose. It will generate additional floods uh, for water supply as well as flood control retention. And it provides later season enhancement for environmental flows, as my colleagues have talked about earlier, because you have an additional asset pool of the stream. Now, the number of system-wide benefits, I won't go through them in detail, just given the time that we have, but I just want to focus on a few points. Water supply benefits, clearly, local, regional. Um, here's the interesting one, number three. For those federal contractors who are regional, who get shorted on federal, um, uh, federal shortages during water short years, if you have an additional um, impoundment on your own given water right, you might not be faced with those same shortages. On the downstream flood control side, this is what, this is what I really, really like. Um, if we end up putting up a new 200,000 acre foot reservoir upstream of Folsom, think about the existing encroachment curve for Folsom right now. I mean, it was iteratively authorized. I think it's expired right now, but the uh, current 
Uh, encroachment curve for Folsom is a, four, is a variable 400 670. And by that I mean 400,000 to 670,000. That's the empty space requirement that has to be maintained in Folsom. Now think about that. Folsom has a capacity of about 977,000 acre feet. So when you have a 670,000 foot encroachment curve, that's a pretty big hole you have to dig into Folsom Reservoir to maintain flood control risks. Now here's where you can get smart about this and say, okay, listen, I'm gonna combine climate change with new storage development. Now what does climate change do? We looked at those first slides. The initial spring peak is gonna be diminished. Why do we draw Folsom down so hard every single year? Because we have no idea how that spring freshet is going to react. The one thing we do not do in flood operations is we always err on the side of caution. We do not want water flowing over. So we drop that down. The risk then becomes every year between water supply managers from my side versus my flood control brethren is that if we guess wrong, we drop that reservoir down thinking that it's going to refill and like 2007 was a wake-up call. We got this as, as um, uh, Mike and uh, uh, Pete were talking about, if the April 1st snow survey equivalent or, or snow survey says, hey, you know what, we're up, we've got a lot of water up in the snowpack. You got to keep that reservoir down because that water's going to come in. Well, voila, what happened? Very, very warm, snowpack ablated. The reservoir is practically bone dry. We were waiting at Folsom for that runoff to come into the reservoir. Nothing came in. Bad situation. Good situation is that it became one of the most active water transfer years um, that we've seen in recent times. So it is that balance all the time that's very, very important. So my contention is that if you put in new impoundments upstream, naturally, it has to have some benefit for downstream terminal reservoir flood encroachment. Now again, albeit, you put a new reservoir of 200,000 acre feet on the south fork, it's not gonna have any flood control benefit to the middle fork and the north fork, but overall, I've gotta believe that for the downstream reservoir Folsom, that encroachment curve's gotta come down. And that'll have more implications to the uh, environmental flow uh, uh, issues uh, later on here. Hydropower development, that's pretty straightforward. Again, as I mentioned, we're talking high elevation storage, you've got visual acuity in terms of the topography. We're gonna develop hydraulic head potential. Any new project that goes up in the Sierras has got to have higher power development. In stream flow benefits, again, with that additional impoundment upstream, you now have the ability to meet out your flow releases on a more managed basis. You can keep those upper stream tributaries wet and providing habitat and flow conditions, whereas without that impoundment, you would. We don't live in a human temperate environment, as my colleagues have talked about. We don't get precipitation 12 months a year as I used to get back in the East Coast. It happens four months of the year. Whatever we have and do not store, we don't have any possibility of using. So in stream flow benefits, you pound that water. All you're doing is you're essentially saying, I'm buying that one year insurance policy. So if I have to meet downstream flow requirements for the rest of that year, I have the capability to do that. Uh, reservoir water pool assets. Now this is an interesting one. Um, I'm gonna spend a few seconds on this one. An upstream reservoir is not going to direct, okay, I'll use the American River Basin um, example. Older reservoir is not going to have a direct benefit to Folsom Reservoir Cold Water Pool, clearly. This is where you have to combine operational prescriptions between the federal projects and what new projects you're building upstream. So here's, here's the theory. You're dropping down because of your mandated encroachment curve, Folsom, because of the flood season. You bring in climate change and say that, well, you don't have to. Why are you dropping it down so far? Well, because the April 1st snow, spring freshet. Well, we've already shown that that's migrating out of that period. You don't have to drop it down that far. That's issue number one. Issue number two is because I have a new impoundment that can retain 200,000 acre feet on the south fork. That gives me an additional reason why I don't have to drop that encroachment curve down. What you're doing then with these two factors, climate change and new storage combined in an operational fashion can, on average, perhaps have storage in Folsom at the commencement of the irrigation and m &I season higher than it would otherwise normally be. If you make the assumption then that there's linearity between total storage and your hydrolimnetic volume, then we can, as we have negotiated with NOAA, provide them with kind of a unique, uh, kind of a unique new theory Climate change, new storage, can help NOAA 
meet downstream thermal requirements on a more regular basis relative to current operational conditions. Never been discussed about before. And then no, and no one others are getting very, very interested in what climate change really means to this, because that's their number one issue. You look at their buy-off, or their, their OCAP uh, biological opinion, um, the number one issue is not flow. It wasn't habitat availability. It was thermally controlled. Temperature is number one for anatomous fish. Those life cycles are very sensitive to, to uh, small variations in thermal regimes. Um, so what you're essentially doing is that you're reducing the risk of non-refill and putting in a new structure. Delta water quality enhancements, same sort of thing. There's no direct benefit from my reservoir and older to meeting delta water quality standards. What it does do, and I think my colleagues Pete talked about this, it provides the downstream reservoir operators greater flexibility to meet that. And that's where those water projects have to be linked. They can't be dealt with on an isolated basis. Recreational benefits, that's an obvious one. Anytime you have a new water impoundment, and these have to be multi-purpose, then you're gonna have both water contact and water-related recreational benefits. The enhanced federal and state project flexibility, we've talked about these uh, bullets, I won't go into too much detail here. The bottom line, ladies and gentlemen, is that new storage upstream of an existing terminal rim reservoir uh, framework is gonna essentially reduce the strain imposed upon existing facilities. That's it in a nutshell. It provides the federal and state projects greater flexibility to meet their obligations. Plus, our benefits with an upstream reservoir is that we get to accrue the direct benefits for any surplus. Revenue sales, power generation, it's a tremendous benefit for the local economy. We get that funded by local uh, private investors. You know, in the last year, you wouldn't be surprised how many calls I'm getting from, from, the, from Wall Street investors looking at, because they know we're in a new storage development. Um, their first question, of course, is, have you passed your CEQA test yet? <laughs> um, but that's sort of another issue. Anyways, um, I want to talk a little bit about future reduced yield under the climate change signals that, that uh, Dr. Anderson was talking about. I want to use this one example. These are stacked histograms showing the frequency of water year types. And again, it's, it's, I'll have some um, relevance as you move forward here uh, quickly. So wet, above normal, low normal, dry, and critically dry for both those two watersheds. Okay, here's where we are historically in the last 50 years. Unchanged river indices, unchanged water year type classifications, here's what we're gonna look like in the near term. That's the period that we're in right now. Here's what we're gonna look like in the long term. You can see that there are frequency changes, but it becomes a heck of a lot more egregious on the San Joaquin side. Let's look at the actual some of the numbers. Near term, Sacramento. Long term, 100 years between 1905 and 2000. Critical dry, or critically dry and dry years represented 17% of the year frequency. In the near term, that's gonna go up to 23 to 26%. On the San Joaquin side, it was 38%. It's gonna go up to one every other year. And he thought that was bad. Let's look at the latter part of this century, starting at 2050. San Joaquin side, 34 to 38%. San Joaquin side virtually becomes unmanageable. Two out of every three years is gonna be in dry or critically dry state. Now again, there's a caveat to this. These are the frequencies if we do not change river indices and the existing thresholds that define water year types. So what we're essentially saying is, hey, hydrology is shifting, but we don't wanna shift our water year types. So it just becomes natural, what's happening? That gap grows and grows and grows. What we're advocating is the hydrology shifts, shifts the, shift the regulatory environment or the regulatory metrics along with it. If not, you're gonna be increasingly penalizing yourselves by trying to meet some target that Mother Nature is just telling you you cannot meet. And that's not a good way of moving forward. So let's just look at quick, quickly here uh, what the implications long-term are for, for Delta Hydraulics or Delta Hydrology, Sacramento River Delta inflow, decreasing by about 1. million acre feet, or almost 9% relative to historic conditions, that's long term. San Joaquin side's a little less, 1.2 million acre feet, but a higher proportion. Now here's where it gets really bad. Delta outflow decreases in excess of 3 million acre feet per year, almost 16%. Put that 3 million acre feet in some kind of hydrologic context, what is that? 60% of the total water held by federal contractors in the state of California. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a heck of a lot of water that's not gonna be out, going out the Golden or uh, Carquinez Strait in the long term. Very significant. 
Look at some of the model average flows by time period. This is to scale to give you an idea of the variation in runoff between those two watersheds. Annual totals, both dropping. Again, as you mentioned, the October through March periods, those flows are actually increasing. And they're more than offset by a decrease in the April through July. So this sort of confirms our original generic stream flow response about what's happening to these watersheds. What are the implications then of statewide and regional water initiatives? If we bring in new storage projects that can develop system yield and be attentive to the seasonality shifts, well, anything that's sort of attentive to or, or associated with the need to access additional yield and be sensitive to the hydrologic seasonality is going to be affected. Everything from in-stream flows to cold water pool assets to point of diversion allowances, as well as minimum bypass flows, inter- and intra-regional water agreements, and things such as unimpaired flows. Will it affect major water initiatives here in California? I think it will. Has it been looked at? I don't think it has. So things like, and I think Pete mentioned this, uh, one of the big issues right now is uh, Reclamation's OCAP. We haven't looked at that yet. We want to do that. Of course, I can't mention any presentation in California without talking about the four-letter acronym starting with B and ending in P. So there's that one. And then, of course, uh, what the State Board's doing with their um, updates to the water quality control plan, including the delta flow criteria, as well as, and some of you may not be familiar with this, as well as phase four, which is what? It's the new flow objectives for the 127 priority streams in California. Very, very important. Um, as well as existing practices and procedures, annual federal state water allocations, um, the dedicated B2 water on our CDPIA, it's geographically unbiased. It will benefit, we'll talk about this, something low in the basin as the Friant River restoration flows, and as far north as the Trinity River, uh, river, uh, river restoration flows. It will also benefit uh, initiatives that are currently ongoing, as well as initiatives that are 40, 50, 60 years old. Like the 1960 MOA between Reclamation and Fish and Game that dictates uh, flow releases out of Whiskey Town to meet Clear Creek obligations. So this whole genre of, of um, new actions, storage actions, that can benefit existing water initiatives at a grand scale, at a regional scale, at a small scale. Now, we've been talking about um, water infrastructure, new water infrastructure, and how it's been static. I think it's just as important when you balance the regulatory framework as well, because we can build all the new storage reservoirs in California that we have. Unless we have flexibility in the regulatory environment, all that new construction, all that new yield development goes out the window. I'm going to give you some examples here. There are a number of practices, procedures, and metrics that we as water managers have discretionary authority to manage without going to the state assembly or the state senate or get the governor's signature. We can change certain things. I call them the soft-handed remedies to climate change. One example is water year types. So let's take a look at this, for example. If we want to assume for the fact, for, for the moment, that the bell-shaped curve on the historical frequency of the water year types is acceptable, you know, let, let's all agree. I mean, every, every year is not going to be a wet year. We're going to have some dry years. It's going to be a bell-shaped response. OK, so 17% for critical dry year. What we do then is we model the hydrology in the future, and then we correspond that to the actual river flows that generate that 17% frequency. So when we compare that then to the original threshold table, we focus in on the critical dry year, San Joaquin side, which currently says that if the total is equal to or less than 2.1 million acre feet, it's a critically dry year. Well, that would be true if the historical hydrology continued on forever, but we know it's not. So what we're doing is we're saying, no, 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 no. Hydrology has shifted. You guys have a static water year type definition. That ain't going to work. You are increasingly penalizing the contractors by trying to hit a threshold that simply does not exist. We do this analysis and we say, let's shift this. Let's shift this down. Instead of equal to or, equal to or less than 2.1, that should be brought down to about 1.7. In the near term, it's probably even lower than a 1.1. Long term, that threshold, that critical dry year threshold, could be as low as 800,000 or 900,000 acre feet. The point is, ladies and gentlemen, is we're not generating any water. What we're doing is we're sensitizing and we're reshuffling the deck so 
so that we do not, as contractors and water managers, continue to try to penalize ourselves by trying to meet a threshold that was based on historical hydrology and that we will increasingly be very hard pressed to meet. So it's the acknowledgement then that there's a recognition that the normal water years of the future will increasingly resemble the dry and critical dry years of the past. So when I ask this question about climate scarcity, and I ask the question in sort of almost in a rhetorical fashion, um, are the burdens equally shared? Well, the answer is no, and it's an unfortunate no because our infrastructure is set, it's hard. The regulatory framework is set, it's hard. So what's the only variable? Contractor allegations. I asked a rhetorical question then again, who takes the bigger hits? Unfortunately, today it's always been the contractors. Now we have the ability, we have the wherewithal, we have the knowledge, we have the hydrology, we have the databases to do something about it. We can fine tune many of these thresholds and criteria to better optimize availability under climate change. Because at the end of the day, at the very end of the day, what really makes a difference is that we need to seek better and more effective, tangible, long-term remedies to contractor deliveries, and especially the egg contractors. Right now, given our current framework, both with a lack of storage and with a rather rigid regulatory framework, the egg contractors especially are getting overly hit, and in my view, inappropriately. What I'm proposing here, and I've shared this with the Water Commission and even the Delta Stewardship Council, and certainly Aqua knows about this, these are adaptation possibilities. These will provide, these can be developed quickly and a lot more cheaply. I can guarantee you we can do a complete revision of water year types in California. I can almost guarantee you it's not going to take 15 years and it's certainly not going to take $25 billion. The overall effect of this could be much greater and some of the major infrastructure projects we're talking about, because think about it, water year types in California are used by every single water county in the state of California right now. It's embedded in every single regulatory framework that we're using. This is an easy process to do as long as we think outside the box and combine hydrology, infrastructure, regulatory adaptation, we can come up with these solutions. And we're pushing this very, very hard with, very, uh, with several groups. Uh, I know time's running out here, so I'll try to wrap up here. What do we need to acknowledge? Um, I think that, well, you've heard this before, 20th century infrastructure simply cannot um, uh, remain static given the 21st century uh, challenges. Uh, let's use the new hydrology and the physiography of California to actually dictate the how and where we retain annual surplus. Um, let's incorporate these new reservoirs. As much as we like to keep some sort of parochial control, our real strength and benefit will be in integrating that with the existing federal and state water projects because that's when we can really accrue public benefits and sell that very, very hard politically. What do we need to do then? Uh, capture outflow during times of excess, uh, target the exact areas where climate responses are, are first being, being experienced, and to make that new water yield available to multiple water uses. And my concluding um, slide I like to use a baseball analogy, and I, and I, and I hope this. <laughs> I look at climate change as Mother Nature uh, providing us with a very, very hard-breaking slider. I'm a left, I'm a right-handed batter, so I mean, we're, we're creatures of tradition. We're sitting in the batter's box, we, we dig in our right heel, we have a tendency to try to drive that ball into left field. We always try to pull the ball, pull the ball, pull the ball. And you know, I use me as an example, you know, I have this, propensity of fouling off for you know the last five years every single pitch that comes in on this hard slider foul 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 finally batting coach comes up to me and says Rob you're trying to maintain your, your your existing traditions go with the pitch don't fight it get the bat out there do a bloop single over the first baseman's head you're on base Bottom line is that it doesn't matter how we get on base, we gotta get on base. And I use that in the climate change context. Don't fight it, don't fight it, don't fight it. What it gives you, go with the flow on that. And as a hydrologist, I look at this and I say, yeah, I'm gonna completely strip all the political rhetoric off climate change because that doesn't really matter to me as a physical hydrologist to solve a California water issue. So I look at the strict hydrology, combine it with the institutional uh, 
limitations, I combine it with the operational prescriptions, I combine it with the flexibility or non-flexibility in the environmental framework, and you come up with a new prescription. Before you know it, voila, you have a new package that you can then bring together. My one final example is climate change, cold water pool assets, environmental restoration, and new storage. So when you're negotiating with these agencies, you do small little bites. If then, if then, if then, if then. Before you know it, I have no as a um, Southwest regional administrator saying, you can develop that cold water pool asset? Yeah. And how are you going to do that? With new storage. Now, how does that work again? Before you know it, you have long traditional adversaries who went against new storage projects, that you brought them into the loop by taking small little bites. And that's something I'm very, very excited about. I think that's the new aura and new era of collaborative, strategic, and tactical planning given climate change, given the need for new storage infrastructure, and given the need that we need to really move forward on some creative regulatory enhancements. With that, ladies and gentlemen, I thank you very much for your time.